Welcome to this week's video on reading the Gospels through Hebrew eyes. Mark chapter 13 is a difficult chapter. It's a challenging chapter for preachers, for teachers, for biblical interpreters, for anyone who is reading through these words of Jesus, very important words of Jesus, and trying to discern exactly what he's talking about. In particular, is Jesus referring to the destruction of the temple and everything that surrounds that destruction in the year A.D. 70? Is he talking about the end times and his second coming? Is he talking about both and which parts refer to the destruction of the temple and which parts refer to the destruction that's going to befall the entire world at the second coming of Christ? So hopefully in this video and then one that I will refer to at the end of this video, we're going to bring some clarity to Mark chapter 13. And we're going to do that the way that we always do, not only by looking at the New Testament and its broader context, but also by bringing to bear the Old Testament upon this particular part of the New Testament. And one of the first challenges that we face, beginning with the first part of Mark chapter 13, is simply understanding the significance, the deep and vital significance of the temple for the first century Jew. So what I want to do right away is use a modern example to try and at least give us an inkling of the impact, in fact, the large, largely negative impact that the words of Jesus would have had on those who heard him preach these in their original first century context. So this modern example that I want to use, it perhaps will work for Americans, maybe not for non-Americans, but hopefully you'll get the, the drift when I explain what I'm talking about. So let's imagine just for a minute that we have that we can take four of the highly significant buildings for American democracy, for the American form of government, and for religion in America. Let's imagine we can take the Treasury Building in Washington, D.C., and the White House, and the Capitol Building, and the National Cathedral. Let's imagine we can take all four of these and compress them into one building, one huge building building where everything that all of these various agencies of the government do and, and this religious aspect of the American people. Let's imagine we can put all of those together into one building, and that one building would then be the symbolic center of our national and religious universe, the symbolic center of our national or political and religious universe. Well, if we could do that, we would be at least close to capturing what the temple was for the first century Israelite. It was the symbolic center of their political life. It was the symbolic center of their national life. It was symbolic center of their historic life, we might say. And certainly it was the, was the symbolic center of their religious life. It was the most vital institution with far-reaching implications for the Jews that existed. And so to get rid of the temple or to speak against the temple or to prophesy the destruction of the temple was always to invite possible arrest, possible death, but certainly some pretty violent negative criticisms from those that you were speaking to because it was so central to everything that the first century Jewish life revolved around, that to imagine its non-existence was quite nigh impossible. It was, it was that vital to an understanding of what it meant to be, to be a Jew. So in Mark chapter 13, when Jesus comes along, and as we'll see in just a minute, talks about the coming destruction of the temple, that would be basically like someone coming along and describing the destruction of all those buildings that we just talked about, the religious, political life of the average American. That person, of course, would receive some pretty negative blowback if he or she said that. And, of course, that's why Jesus receives the negative blowback that he does. In fact, it's one of the reasons that he is arrested and charged in Jerusalem leading up to, to his crucifixion was because he spoke against the temple. So, Let's kind of with that in mind, get into Mark chapter 13, and hopefully as we work our way through it, we will have a better understanding of exactly what Jesus is referring to through all of these various details. So to begin with, Mark chapter 13, verses one through three. And as Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples, we're not told which one of this, these disciples it was, but one of them anyway, 
said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. He kind of has the, the awe, the, he's awestruck like a, a tourist, if you will, by the magnificent, uh, magnificence of the temple. Well, Jesus then says to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, a couple of matters from the Greek before we move on to a couple of other details. As Jesus came out, that Greek phrase, ek pru omenu altu, is going to be matched by him then going to the Mount of Olives in just a minute. So he's coming out, and then he's going to sit on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to, he's going to teach or preach from there. But there is also possibly this idea, we're going to get to that in a minute from Ezekiel, of Jesus as the designated Son of the Father, as the glory of God in a man, now leaving the temple. He's going out, just as, as we'll see momentarily, the glory of the Lord left the temple in Ezekiel's day. So he's going out. God is leaving his temple. And then secondly, there are a couple of double negatives. So in English, we can't have a double negative, at least not in precise, proper grammar, but Greek can. When Greek has two, when Greek has a double negative, so a no-no, and then it has it twice in this verse, this is a way of emphasizing it. So in that last phrase, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. You see there's, there's two negatives. Actually, in Greek, there's four. <laughs> so it most certainly won't be left here one of these stones upon another. So two double negatives. This is an extremely emphatic statement, in other words, on the part of Jesus. This is the picture, by the way, of the fulfillment of what Jesus says in Mark chapter 13. This is skipping forward about four decades to A.D. 70. This is one artist's depiction of the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened by the Roman armies, and Jerusalem was, as Jesus said, completely destroyed, and literally not one stone was left upon another. So this is about, Jesus says these words about 40 years before their, their fulfillment. Now, what was the temple like? What kind of impact would it have made on like one of Jesus' disciples or anyone else who came up to that, we get an inkling of what that was like from Josephus. Josephus was the Jewish historian. I refer to him often in these, in these videos, Jewish historian from the latter part of the first century AD. And in his book on the Jewish wars, he describes what you saw as you came to the temple. He says, now the outward face of the temple and its front wanted nothing that was likely to surprise either men's minds or their eyes, for it was covered all over with plates of gold of great weight. And at the first rising of the sun, now the temple faced east, so kind of bear that in mind, at the first rising of the sun reflected back a very fiery splendor and made those who forced themselves to look at and made those who forced themselves to look upon it to turn their eyes away just as they would have done at the sun's own rays. But this temple appeared to strangers when they were coming to it at a distance, like a mountain covered with snow. So extremely, uh, extremely striking appearance that the temple has. It was a magnificent structure, and you could see it from a distance, and the impact visually that it would have made on those who gazed at it was just phenomenal, especially those who were seeing it for, for the first time. So that helps to explain why one of Jesus' disciples was saying what he was saying. Look at these buildings. Look at these stones. They're just really mind-blowing. They're so amazing. They're so awesome. And then Jesus says in stark realism, yeah, but all of this is going to be torn down. Now, Jesus was not by any means the first to talk about the destruction of the temple. We have Old Testament examples of this as well. In fact, if you go all the way back to when the temple was built, during the reign of Solomon. In 1 Kings chapter 9, Solomon himself talks about how if Israel rebels against the covenant, this house, talking about the temple, this house will become a heap of ruins. And that's precisely what happened to it a few generations later in 586 BC when the Babylonians destroyed the first temple. Seventy years later, it was, or after 70 years later, after the exile, was over, it was rebuilt and then expanded by Herod. But again, it had become a heap of ruins before, it could become a heap of ruins again. And then other prophets talked about the destruction of the temple. Uh, Jeremiah had prophesied this destruction, which got him 
into almost as much trouble as it got Jesus because he was arrested. He was threatened, in fact, with execution for preaching against the temple. And then even later, after the resurrection of Jesus, Stephen himself was accused of being in league with Jesus, who also spoke about the destruction of the temple. So because the temple was so important to them, speaking against it, preaching against it, prophesying against it, was basically considered to be a, an offense that was at least worthy of arrest, if not execution. So that kind of helps us, I think, to understand just what kind of negative response these words of Jesus would have received. Now, let's move on to the next section. This is four, this is three through four. As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew, I underline Andrew there because usually it's just the trio, Peter, James, and John, but in this instance, Andrew is thrown into the midst. So these first disciples that Jesus called, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they ask him privately. Now this, by the way, follows the same pattern we've seen elsewhere in the Gospels where Jesus will make a public statement and then privately he will explain it more intricately and expansively to his disciples. Same thing happening here. He made that public statement about the temple being destroyed stone by stone, and now privately to his disciples, he's going to expand upon exactly what he means. And they ask him, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? So when's this going to happen? And what should we be looking for, basically? And then on the slide, I have a... uh, uh, a map of exactly where the Mount of Olives was. It's important to understand ourselves geographically here because when Jesus and his disciples leave Jerusalem, they go eastward. We'll pick up on that in just a minute. They go eastward. They're going to go down across the Kidron Valley and then up to the Mount of Olives, which faces directly east of the temple. Now, this slide has two different pictures, two different perspectives from modern Jerusalem to help us understand exactly where Jesus and his disciples would have positioned themselves. So the slide on the left is a picture from the top of the Mount of Olives facing then to the west. That, of course, is not the temple. That's the Dome of the Rock, but that's where the temple would have been. So if you're on the Mount of Olives and you are looking there for west, that's where approximately where the temple would have been located. The slide on the right is the exact opposite perspective. So if you're close to where the temple would have been standing and you're looking east, you're looking, of course, into the rising sun there, and you would see then the Mount of Olives to the left there. So that gives you a perspective exactly how close Jesus and his disciples were when they left the temple and then sat on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus delivered this discourse. The point being, he's basically got this visual in front of him as he talks to his disciples. They are more or less looking at the temple from atop the Mount of Olives when Jesus delivers this address. Now, there's some Old Testament background here from Ezekiel that I alluded to earlier that kind of sets this in its proper context. Ezekiel, centuries before this, saw in a vision the departure of the glory of the Lord from the temple. And this departure was eastward. We hear about this in two different passages from Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 10, he sees the glory of the Lord leaving the threshold of the house. The cherubim are carrying it. And it says they stood at the entrance of the east gate of the house of the Lord. And the glory of the God of Israel was over them. So they're at the east gate on the very boundary of the temple, the very gate, in fact, that Jesus and his disciples would have just left in Mark chapter 13. Now skip forward to Ezekiel 11, and it says the cherubim lifted their wings. They are carrying the, the throne of God. And it says the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain, stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. Now, what mountain would that have been? The Mount of Olives. So the glory of the Lord, because the temple was so infested with detestable idols in Ezekiel's day, the glory of the Lord packed up and left, packed that unclean place, and therefore the temple was ripe for destruction. Same thing basically is happening here in Mark chapter 13. The glory of the Lord, Jesus Christ, is leaving the temple eastward. He's going to the mountain that is on the eastern side of the city, the Mount of Olives, same mountain that the glory of the Lord went to in Ezekiel's vision. 
And here, the glory of the Lord incarnate, Jesus Christ, is going to talk about this temple and its coming destruction. Now, moving on to the next few verses. This is Mark 13, 5 through 8. Jesus began to say to them, so he's beginning this long discourse, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines, but these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Now, I'm going to go through some details in this, but the first thing I want to point out is this is not talking about the second coming of Christ. I'm not saying that some of those details don't also apply to the second coming of Christ, but this is not, com- this is not talking about the end. It's not talking about when Christ returns in power and great glory and the judgment and the resurrection of the body. This is talking, Jesus is talking here about the coming destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem. That's it. So I'll explain that a little bit more, actually a lot more, in the video that I refer to at the end of this video, but bear that in mind. We're used to hearing some of this language as talking about the end. It's talking about the end for sure, but it's the end of the temple, the end of Jerusalem as it was in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed it. Now, some details. First of all, this many will come in my name, saying, I am he, leading many astray. We know from the testimony of Josephus, that Jewish historian I referred to a minute ago, that in the 40 years leading up to the destruction of the temple, so between about the time Jesus said this and when the temple was destroyed, during those four decades, there were a lot of false prophets, a lot of false teachers, a lot of false Christ who were highly popular, and they led a lot of people astray. Josephus mentions by name a magician by the name of Thutis, who led a lot of people astray, taking them out to the Jordan River. There were the sons of a man named Judas of Galilee. Now, Judas of Galilee is actually referred to by Stephen in the book of Acts. Now, these are his sons. So the sons of Judah of Galilee, Judas of Galilee, they also led a rebellion against the Romans. And then Josephus mentions various other, what he calls imposters and deceivers, who led whole multitudes astray. So no surprise that Jesus prophesies that this will come true. Secondly, he says, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, well, don't be alarmed. This must take place, but the end, and I added there, the end of the temple, because this is not talking about the second coming. This is the end of the temple won't happen yet. And of course, there were plenty of military strifes and whatnot taking place in those four decades. You had the wars between Rome and Parthia. You had Herod Antipas, who was Uh, battling the Nabataeans. You had local uprisings here and there throughout the Roman Empire. Lots of wars, lots of rumors of wars. That was all taking place, but it wasn't the end. The end was not to come until 70 AD. Thirdly, nation's going to rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There's going to be famines. So you have these elements of creation that are going to be uh, showing signs of creation's gradual demise. Well, we know that, again, from Josephus, there was an earthquake in A.D. 67 in Palestine. Uh, Pompeii had one in A.D. 62. Acts 11.28 and Josephus both talk about the famine that happened during the reign of Claudius. From He reigned from 41 to, to 54. So, of course, there were earthquakes. Of course, there were famines in the first century. And Jesus says these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Now, birth pains, that particular phrase is used both in the New Testament as well as in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to describe a whole wide variety of sufferings that that overtake people. When we talk about birth pains, when when that is used metaphorically in the Bible, it does not refer necessarily to the end times. It doesn't have any, in other words, any kind of strict meaning that refers to the eschaton. It's just a general word for birth pangs, for pains or sufferings that that overtake people. Now, let's look at the closing few verses of this section of Mark chapter 13. This is verses 9 through 13. But be on your guard, For they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. 
and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Again, this is not talking, even though many of these details also apply to situations leading up to the second coming of Christ, Jesus is here referring to all of the events that will transpire in the decades after his ascension leading up to Jerusalem's destruction. So this is talking about first century stuff. Again, not saying that some of this doesn't apply across the centuries and apply to the second coming of Christ, the events leading up to that. But that is specifically not what Jesus is describing here. He's describing the various kinds of situations, sufferings, trials, imprisonments, persecutions, uh, threats and dangers, all of these things that will befall his disciples leading up to the temple's Roman destruction. Now, some details in these verses. First of all, he says, be on your guard. The Greek verb there is blepo. It's the, the form blepita. It's the second time Jesus has used that verb here. The first time he says to watch out or to be on guard. He says, see to it that no one leads you astray. So that's the same verb that's used there. He's just using it here in a different sort of way. He's applying it more directly to his disciples. So see to it that you're on guard. Watch yourselves. Be aware of what's happening. Why? Because, number one, you're going to be delivered over to the councils. The Greek verb there is the one from which we get Sanhedrin. We know from Jewish sources that there was, yes, the great Sanhedrin that we're more familiar with from the New Testament, but there were also many other smaller Sanhedrins, councils in Jewish communities. That's probably what Jesus is referring to here. So these little s Sanhedrins, we might say, they're going to be delivered over to them. They're also going to be dero, which is the word for beaten in the synagogues. Paul himself uses that verb in connection with synagogues. When he's talking about his pre-conversion life in Acts 22, 19, he says that in one synagogue after another, he imprisoned and dero, beat those who believed in Christ. So, second section of this particular passage is one that is very often confused. Uh, it says the gospel must first be proclaimed to all the nations. Now, this does not refer to the gospel needing to reach all the nations before Christ comes again. I know that that is often, this verse is often used in that sort of way. It's a misuse of this verse. It's not what it's referring to. It's not saying that as soon as we get the gospel out to all people everywhere, every nation, every country, then Jesus is going to come again. No. The gospel was proclaimed to all nations in the first century already. This particular Greek language, pantata ethne, which is translated here as to all nations, occurs in multiple other New Testament passages. And a couple of those I want to highlight because it indicates that already in the first century, in the lifetime of Paul, the Christians understood that the gospel had reached all nations. The gospel reached all nations, according to the Greek meaning of this phrase, in the first century. We're not waiting for this to happen. It's already happened. So for instance, in 2 Timothy 4.17, Paul says, the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be, might be fully proclaimed, and panta ta ethne, all the nations, all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. So Paul, using the exact same phrase that Jesus used in Mark chapter 13, says that all the nations have already heard it through his ministry. He's, he's understanding that the gospel has gone out to all the Gentiles, which is basically what all the nations means. Don't think in terms of modern geopolitical uh, parts of the world. This is talking about the Gentiles. Again, Romans 16, 26. Paul says the message of the gospel has been made known, pontata ethne, same Greek phrase, to all nations. Already in the ministry of Paul, it's happened. And then the same sort of language is heard in Acts chapter 2, verse 5. At Pentecost, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. 
apo pantos ethnus ton hypo ton uranon. So from every nation under heaven, they were all there at Pentecost when the gospel was proclaimed. Therefore, this has already happened. All of this has already taken place in the first century. As soon as the gospel was proclaimed in, at Pentecost and through the ministry of Paul and through the rest of the disciples and the apostles, it was understood that all the nations, Pantheta Ethne, had heard the proclamation. So don't think that this somehow needs to happen to, as it were, clear the way for Jesus to return again, as if by our missionary activity we can expedite the second coming of Christ. That's not what this is saying. This has already been fulfilled long ago. Of course, we still get the gospel. Of course, we still engage in missionary activity, but we're not by that, as it were, greasing the wheels for Jesus to come again. That has already happened. The gospel has already been proclaimed in fulfillment of what Jesus said, because, of course, all the nations needed to hear the gospel before the temple was destroyed in AD 70. Now, one more detail, and then we'll wrap up. He who endures to the end shall be saved. This end here does not necessarily refer to a specific time point. The Greek phrase there is astelos, and it can mean kind of right through or as long as it lasts or continually. This is the phrase used, for instance, in Luke 18, 5, in the parable that Jesus told about that woman that kept bothering that judge, and finally he relents and says, all right, I'll give her what she wants. He says, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her astelos, her continual coming. So it kind of has this meaning of as long as it lasts or right through or something like that. It doesn't necessarily mean up until some designated point. And it certainly does not mean up until the end of time. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about all of these various persecutions and trials that are going to befall his disciples as it leads up to Jerusalem and the temple's destruction. So that's just the first 13 verses, first, uh, first section of Mark chapter 13. Next Sunday, the reading is going to continue in Mark chapter 13. I've already done a video on that. I did it last year in which I covered this particular passage. So you can refer to that. It's in the 1517 YouTube channel. I called it Football Falling Stars Christ prophetic lingo, thinking like a prophet about Jesus' warning words in Mark 13, 24 through 27. And I deal with that whole section there where I talk about exactly what these words of Jesus mean in the rest of Mark chapter 13. So hopefully you will find that helpful. And that also means, therefore, if you're a weekly watcher of these videos, that I will not be producing a new video next week. Instead, I would refer to, to that one that I already did. So you can check that out on the 1517 YouTube channel. And I'll put a link to that uh, in the notes to this video so that you can more easily find it on the channel. Well, this has been a, felt like a quick run through for me of Mark chapter 13, those first few verses. It's, it's highly detailed. And as I say, it can be easily confusing, but hopefully this has provided a little bit of insight and clarity to you as you reflect upon these words, these very important words from our Lord about what was happening up to the destruction of the temple in AD 70. May God bless each of you, and may his mercy and grace keep you faithful as you serve him and as you live in his grace throughout your daily lives. God's peace be yours in abundance. We'll see you in two weeks.